Welcome back to everyone. Some of you have been with us all day. Thank you for spending this time. We are so fortunate to have all of our speakers here this afternoon. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of time to introduce Bobby Blanchard, who you just saw in the film. Um, but I want to tell you first about the format for this session. We've given some of the time to Bobby so that she can talk to you more about the filmmaking and her role in it. and. Um, uh, answer some questions that are specific to the film. And then we will open it up for a Q&A for all of the speakers. Um, and we are interested in your thoughts and uh, questions and ideas, so please do feel free to interact, uh, have interactive discussion. Um, so, um, Bobby, as you know, played the role of the director of the Children's Center at uh, Bedford Hills, um, for a position she held from 2005 to 2010. And now she is a senior staff associate at the Center for Children and Families at Columbia University School of Nursing. She is an attorney, as you saw in the film, and she has worked on issues related to maternal incarceration for over 18 years. Um, she is here to share some of her perspective about her role at Bedford and the issues that were presented in the film. I also just want, before I ask her to stand up, just want to see if there's anyone who did not receive a form that looks like this. And if you could raise your hand, I will get one to you. Thank you. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for staying late, staying after the movie. Um, um, so as Carrie said, I was the director of the Children's Center from 2005 to 2010. And, and prior to that, I ran the nursery program there for several years, about eight years. And prior to that, I ran the playroom, which is the space where you saw the children playing. So I have a pretty long experience um, in direct service with mothers um, who are incarcerated as well as their kids. Um, I didn't plan to be in this movie <laughs> at all. Um, in fact, I don't like to be photographed, and I, I have a, a bit of a shy nature. But um, Jen McShane, being Jen McShane, was able to get approval from the Department of Corrections to make this film, which was pretty unprecedented in New York. Um, New York has a pretty, a pretty uh, tight shield over their corrections department, and she is a persistent dog with a bone like you've never met. And she, she was determined to make this film, so she got permission, and so when she came and said, you know, um, I'm going to make this film. I said, that's great, you know, awesome, happy to help in any way I can. And then the next thing I know, I'm in the movie. <laughs> and that was not <laughs> part of the plan. Um, but it was an honor to be part of it. And, and since then, I've been, I've been able to, to do these appearances with the film, which kind of um, is an important follow-up, I think, because when you watch the film and you see it, um, it sort of looks like Rome got built in a day, and that's not at all the case. The Children's Center's been around for over 40 years. So there's a lot of history, there's a lot of background, and um, I'm still involved, just, just so you know what I'm doing now. I'm at the Center for Children and Families, um, but direct service is my calling, and I learned that quickly as soon as I got involved with academics. <laughs> I was warned, but I didn't listen. And so I love being in that research field, but I also really am still very involved with direct service. So I'm working now at Takana Correctional Facility, which is directly across the street from Bedford. And I'm very involved with corrections in Vermont at this point. So they're a kind of a population that might resemble yours here in Minnesota, heavily rural um, and uh, heavily uh, poor. So um, that's just sort of what I'm doing now. and. Um, I, I can give you a little history about um, how Jen made this film, which was, it was a bit of a, um, a surprise to all of us how long she remained involved in the project. So, you know, we were accustomed to journalists that wanted to come in and take a quick snapshot of what inside prison looked like and mothers in jail. And, and there was some pretty um, sensational stories that were done. Jen stayed with this project for five years and she followed the families for five years and actually had permission to come into the facility five times, um, which was also unprecedented. And toward the end, they were sort of like, are you still around? Haven't you given up? She really wanted to tell the story thoroughly. So that's why you get to see such an amazing picture of each of the families, because she was able to not only um, persist in her, her work with the corrections department to get access, but she also created really profound relationships 
with the women and their families. So that also gave her access to stuff that a lot of journalists just don't take the time to get access to. So I think it tells a really pretty complete story. Um, and, and you know, it sort of made us all characters in a way that we've never been characterized before. So I can answer questions for you um, if you have any for me. And if you have other uh, questions for Jason or for Rebecca, I can defer to them. Yes, ma'am. Yes. <laughs> well, you asked a really good question, which was, can you? And, you know, technically, no. Um, there are very strict rules about that. However, um, it's what's happening. And, and uh, so far, I haven't been questioned too much. So, so I'll go down the list. Um, actually, Anithia, I do not stay in contact with. Um, but I know that she's doing okay. She's living in Schenectady, or, or Hudson rather, with her children. Um, another mother who I've only stayed in contact with because she's part of a study that I'm involved in is Melissa, Emma's mom. And she is now independent and living with Emma, as well as uh, her boyfriend. And she's struggling a little bit, um, but she's hanging in there. And she hasn't gone back to prison. And that's pretty much uh, one of the major outcomes we're looking for. Because especially short-termers, they tend to go back. Um, so Melissa, just to tell you a little bit about that study, is part of a longitudinal study that's being done at the Center for Children and Families by Dr. Mary Byrne. And um, she's studying the outcomes of a cohort of 100 women who gave birth and live with their babies on the nursery. And Melissa was one of the women in the study. So she's, she's still hanging in there. Um, Mona is alive and well and really kicking, um, as, which is no surprise to anybody. In fact, I, I used to have to like get the hook out when we would do these things together, because I could not get her to pipe down. She loved doing this. And so she is um, actually doing this on her own a little bit now, going with the film to various places. And she was working for a gentleman who started a a company to help rich people access the Department of Motor Vehicles. Um, you know, they didn't have time, they were too busy, so they wanted someone to go for them, and now she's starting her own company to do that. So she's an entrepreneur, and as well as traveling with the film and, and really enjoying it. Um, so um, that's Mona. So who do I have? Melissa, Mona. Rosa Garcia's finally out of jail and living at a, a transitional housing program in Long Island City, uh, which is part of Queens, New York. And um, she has contact with her boys and um, is doing well. And she's, in fact, being honored at a, at a luncheon that they're giving, a fundraising luncheon, in, in a few weeks. I think it's in May, sometime May, middle of next, middle of next week, maybe. Um, and I saw that on the invitation. I said, well, that's, that, that could only be something good, um, that she's being honored. Uh, so that's Rosa. Tanika is unfortunately still inside. And she just recently went to the parole board for the first time and um, got hit. So she will be in for another two years. And that was a big disappointment. Um, we were hoping the film would maybe influence the parole board a little bit. Um, but it's not typical for a, a woman with that kind of charge to get out the first time she goes to the board. It would, it would have been a, a long shot. But we, had, we actually kind of had high hopes, I hate to say it, but, um, but she's in for, for another couple years. So did I cover everybody? I think I did. Um, that's a good question. So Tanika's two boys are doing fine. Um, the older boy, it was a really good, in fact, it makes me think of Jason's story when Jason and I were talking before about leaving your home and how hard it is. Um, he was to go to college and he was doing fine in terms of getting it organized. He had some help from people at the Children's Center and was really, was really on that tra trajectory and literally packed, like, I mean, duffel bags packed, and then couldn't get himself to go couldn't get in the car. And um, that went on for about a year of not being able to get in the car. <laughs> and then finally did, finally got in the car. 
And, and then he kind of had to go home. He's had a really hard time separating um, from not just his family, but also the community where he grew up, which was familiar. He was a basketball player and had high hopes of playing basketball. Um, but it really, it was something we witnessed over and over and over again with the teenagers that um, they, they may know something is good for them, or, but the, there's, very, um, there's very little uh, that supports them in getting over that obstacle of familiarity and the fear of the unknown. Um, but he did end up going back and had some supports in the school by that time, and they kind of hung on to him. So he, he's in college. Um, and uh, let's see who else. Emma's in school. Emma's doing fine. Emma had a, um, a good background in that way in that they really they knew certain things needed to happen for her. Um, who am I missing? Joey, at, well, this, now this is an amazing story. Not so much about Joey. Joey was always the star of the family. Joey was always the kid that everybody loved. And Joey really decompensated when he got to be an adolescent. But he rallied because he had a really, really good social worker. Because Rosa went from Bedford, and she had to go to New Jersey and do some time. And that was a shock. The kids were not expecting that. So he fell apart and had a very difficult time when he was about 15, 16 started doing some stuff that was really out of character, stealing, stuff like that. And his social worker uh, immediately was able to help him rally. But she had been with that family for uh, close to 10 years. So they had such a deep relationship that it was really effective. I don't know what would have happened had that social worker not been there to kind of to shore him up. But what was so interesting was Jacob. Because I had not seen Jacob for about five years after I left the Children's Center. Well, his mother left first, and so he stopped coming to the programs, which they sometimes don't want to do. The kids still want to come, even though mom's not incarcerated anymore, <laughs> which is always like, what are we going to do about that one? <laughs> it just, it didn't seem out of, it didn't, it made perfect sense to them. I don't want, I want to, can I still come on the visits? Well, no, mom's not here anymore. <laughs> but he came to one of these screenings, and it was in New York City. And it was a big screening, at sort of a film festival type screening, and there were a lot of people there, and it was a big dark theater. And, and I'm, st I'm standing up there, and he stood up and came up on the stage. This is little Jacob, who cried at every single visit and had such a hard time. He got up, gave me a big hug, and he answered questions for the audience. And I, I was like, this can't be Jacob. It was so, so wonderful. And he was emailing me for a while, and he wanted to get in touch with Sharif and Kareem, because they had been very close. And again, when moms separate, kids separate. So thank God social media was invented just for children of the incarcerated. Um, and I was able to you know, get permission to share their emails, and so they were able to get back in touch. And that's sort of the profound uh, message of, of this film, but also of the work we did at the Children's Center, which was um, how much these kids need connection with each other and how few venues there are for that. And the irony of the fact that where they feel the most comfortable in their own skin is inside, where everybody has the same issue in their lives. And they can actually strategize with each other and talk about it. And I would overhear kids saying things like, well, what do you do when somebody says, where's your mom? Oh, you know, I'll tell you what I do. I carry a picture in my backpack and I pull it out. And I say, here's my mom. And they say these things to each other and they're like, oh, could, I, could you say that again and I could put it on a videotape? <laughs> Um, and Jacob was one of those kids. He was there so regularly that he and Sharif and Kareem became very close. And, and uh, it was a big loss for him. And that was the first thing he wanted. He wanted to know, how can I get in touch with Sharif and Kareem? Um, so who else do we have? Mona's a grandma. Uh, Mona's a grandma, and both of her kids are doing really well. And they, again, had an extended family that was able to absorb a lot. Um, but it was not an easy road for them. It was not an easy road. In fact, Sister Elaine, who you met in the film, who was one of my, my first mentors in this work and probably my most important one, tells a story about um, Justin. 
because she used to drive Justin back and forth from the prison um, to home. And Justin one day um, said, um, asked about uh, Providence House, which is one of the places that Sister was living in. It was a transitional housing program for formerly incarcerated women. He goes, so Sister, what's Providence House about? And she says, well, you know, Justin, that's for women who get out of prison and have no place to go. And so, you know, she drops him off at the house, and he, he, he chases her. She's pulling away in her car, and he, she's chasing her, and she rolls down the window. She goes, what is it, Justin? And he goes, you tell my mom when she gets out, she has a place to go. Um, and when she told that story, you know, you look at Justin, and you look at... Uh, you know, his brother Travis, and you go, they're good, they're doing fine, look at them, they're, you know, they're on the, they really had a hard time, those kids. And, and I think if it hadn't been for Sister Elaine and, and Mona and the Children's Center um, all collaborating to keep them together, um, it might not have been such a great outcome for them. Um, did I cover all the kids? Probably not. You know, I don't know how they're doing. I don't know how they do, uh, I don't so much keep in touch with that family. Um, she's a person, and, and as is Melissa, who kind of wanted to, to close that chapter of her life, and so they don't keep in real close touch, um, and that's not unusual. Um, and it's something that, you know, when I first started doing this work, and that was like 20 years ago, I realized, boy, these people are, are gonna, you know, they don't stay in your life forever. <laughs> You know, you may get, get to work one day and somebody's been transferred and you may never speak to them again and you may have been working with them for five years. So it's that kind of work and um, I just, you just respect that they, that's, the chapter's over for them. They've moved on. Yes, ma'am. Um, so the question was, is there, I'm repeating this, um, the, the question is, was, are there studies that show recidivism rates about moms who stay connected versus moms who don't? Um, the, the study that it relates to the nursery mothers um, has been done both by the Department of Corrections as well as by Dr. Byrne, um, and the recidivism rate among nursery mothers is quite low um, versus general population. Um, I don't know, Rebecca, if you know of another study that you want to... That's the one I would have referenced. Yeah, there's, there's not a lot of study done. Um, this is a, a really challenging group of people to do research with. Um, and, and, the, and the fact that Dr. Byrne has followed a group for 10 years, everybody kind of goes, whoa, that's amazing. Uh, but she did it in a, in a very, very particular way with a very intentional intervention associated with it. So there was a, a lot of incentive to remain in the study. So folks get lost, and, and you really don't know. I will say that um, I see women come back, um, but I also see a lot of women that don't come back. So I don't know that contact with children is necessarily the factor. Um, what I see in the women is that, that um, they, they, they age out of it. Um, and they, and, and if for, in New York, at least, they get education while they're inside. So they have options when they get out that they didn't have when they came in. And that, that contributes to lowering recidivism tremendously. And those studies have been done. Education is really the thing that, that cuts it. Yeah. I just wanted to follow up with a note about Mona. Um, the event that we sponsored last November, we were able to have Mona present after the showing of the film, and we did an interview with her um, following the film showing, and it is on our website. So I just wanted you to know that if you go to the website that's on this bookmark, you can see an interview with, with Mona um, that was just done last fall. Thank you, Bobby. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions? Sure. I have a question, but it's for Rebecca. Sure. So you have, we have to. Okay. I could listen to her all day. And I, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, and I'm really passionate about this. I've worked in our county jail in Orange County. We've talked before. When does Minnesota get smarter and let our moms keep their babies as custody? Oh, gosh. What are the changes that have happened is what I want to know. What do I need to do? The question was <laughs> <laughs> when is Minnesota going to get more progressive? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, 
I think we're getting there. Um, I think in the last year, I have seen things happen in the state of Minnesota that I put on my long-term goals. I put on my, when I become a tenured faculty member, I want to see us thinking about kids. I was in my first year as an assistant professor and I was thinking these are these are my first year goals, these are my five year goals, like this, that's going to be a long time away, right? And I got a call one day from a colleague of mine at the Department of Corrections or an email and she said, uh, you got to go on the home page. And I, my stomach dropped and I was panicked. And I logged on to, you know, the state DOC web page and there was this whole new web page with a drop-down menu for children and families. And I, th I about fell out of my chair. And on it was all of the Sesame Street resources. And I thought, we're making progress. Now, it's a website, but prior to that, there was no mention of children on the website. And that, to me, signified a really important first step in recognition of the problem. So there's that. There is also some legislation right now that is being um, heard. It passed through the Senate and House committees, and we are hoping for a vote on the floor soon um, to provide pregnancy testing for women in prisons and jails to uh, prohibit shackling of any kind during pregnancy and the postpartum period to provide postpartum support. There's a whole slew of other things. Anyway, that to me also signifies that we have the ears of important legislators who get that this is a piece of the puzzle. Um, and so I think we're getting there. I will tell you that in a meeting with someone at the Department of Corrections, well, first of all, <laughs> I've had some really important meetings with the Department of Corrections and the Commissioner of Corrections and the Commissioner of Health lately, and simply getting the two of them in the same room to have the Commissioner of Health say, this is a public health problem and we need to be thinking about these individuals as parents and the next generation, to me was progress. Um, and then, you know, thinking about other folks in the Department of Corrections, and I can think about specific examples with our prison doula project in particular, where they said, we want to know the difference between the timing, I was just telling Bobby this, the timing between when, when women give the birth to their babies and when they're released. What's that timeline? And that, to me, was a place where I feel like science can really inform policy. And so I was able to go back and say really quickly, this is the time between delivery date and release date, and it's a pretty short window. And so if we have such a huge percentage of moms who are actually released within six months, then we can talk about alternatives to incarceration. We can talk about breastfeeding. We can talk about ways that we can support moms and babies. And so I think we're getting there. But selfishly, my motivation in continuing to say yes to all of the things that CYFC and others have asked me to do over the last year and not get enough sleep is because I hope that people like you will go out and say, okay, what can we do in our communities? This is a problem. This is a problem that I've, you know, we sort of pulled the wool over off of people's eyes and have now opened um, the door to recognizing that this is a huge problem and hoping that people like you will, you know, tell your colleagues and talk to your legislators and say, we can do better than this. We're Minnesota and we're progressive in a lot of other ways, but we're not quite there yet on this one. No. In fact, we have, so they can have no contact with their, anybody beyond the doula and the correctional officers who are in the room. I'm sorry, I didn't repeat the question. The question was, I see him back there going like this. Uh, she works in a juvenile correctional facility and many of the uh, gentlemen there are fathers and they will release the juveniles to to see their partners, the, the birth of their babies, um, which is quite progressive. I didn't know that was happening. Which facility is that? Okay. Yeah. Which is wonderful. At our at the Minnesota Department of Corrections for the women who deliver in custody, they can have no contact with anyone besides our doula and the correctional officers and the nursing staff that are there, the, the hospital staff. Um, so this is particularly hard when you consider that, you know, people assume these are all single women. They're not. I mean, their husbands are out in the lobby and can't be there for the birth of their babies. Um, 
you know, their, their partners who want to be there and want to engage. And I think that's particularly hard when we think about we've actually actively shut out fathers in a way where we could be engaging them and using that as a way to support this kid and support this family and really wrap our arms around and we're not there yet. So, yeah. Is this program anywhere in the United States that um, has something that supports fathers being involved in their children? Yeah, and Jason, do you want to answer that question? This question is about programs and states around fathering and incarceration. And the answer is yes, but do you want to expand on that or do you want to talk about? Because we are doing some stuff around that in our state too. Um, we, have a num we have a number of projects for, for guys who are fathers. Um, Ruth Johnson at the Council on Crime and Justice, she goes into facilities and does parenting groups for fathers, prepares them, okay, how do you handle anger? Um, how does it show up when you're parenting your child? Um, she has them like draw their hand and send it to their kid. That way, you know, the kid can feel like they're holding hands and things like that. So there are projects going on. We have the Father Project, um, Urban Ventures. Um, they do a lot of great work as far as fathers and getting parenting skills and things like that. But you see a lot of programming inside institutions. Unfortunately, a lot of them don't last. But um, there are programming. There are programs out there that, that help fathers become better fathers before they're released. I just wanted to say something about the nursery question. Um, so now there's seven states, maybe only six now, that have prison nurseries. The unique thing about New York's prison nursery that you saw depicted in the film is that it exists by statute. It's actually a right of the mother to keep her child while the child is in custody, or while the mother's in custody. Um, other states created their nurseries later, and those nurseries are by um, policy. They are considered a public health benefit. They are considered a social benefit. Um, it took a lot of will to create those nurseries. Um, it's coming from a slightly different direction. They're run slightly differently. Um, but it's really that will on the part of the citizens of the state that has to, that has to happen. Because prison nurseries cost money. They take up correctional time on things that corrections don't necessarily want to spend time on. Um, they need a really, um, a really supportive infrastructure within not only corrections, but also the community to support the various things that have to go on, medical attention for children, medical attention for mothers, all those kinds of things. So, you, you know, the community has to be supportive of it. Um, so there's alternatives to that that I think are in some ways better alternatives. And that's kind of where, um, where, I hope we go. Prison nurseries are great, but most of the women that take advantage of prison nurseries really don't have to be in prison. That's the bottom line. So keep them in the community if you can, in some kind of alternative. And that's a lot less expensive. You can access homeless services. You can access a whole variety of other services that aren't available for people who are inside, just by the fact that they're an inmate. They're a, they belong to the state. They're no longer a citizen, so they can't access those kinds of services. So it's a much better way to approach the problem than actually locking them up and saying, okay, now the state is gonna pay for all this through their Department of Corrections. You can have them be just like a regular citizen, but under certain kinds of scrutiny and supervision. And that's a really good, there's a model in New York called Drew House. It was created by the Brooklyn DA's office. It took about 10 years to get it off the ground, but it was actually created by districts of attorney who said, you know what? Why are we locking these women up? This is crazy. They were felony convicted women. They would have gone to prison, and they've had an amazing success with just creating a house where they can live with their kids. They're under supervision. They have all kinds of things they have to do, uh, but they get a lot out of it, and they get to stay with their families. Um, and many other, state, uh, many other countries in the world do it that way. So I would suggest that, not that you wouldn't want to advocate for prison nurseries, but there are also other models to advocate for as well. I want to add a point yeah. to that. You'll never get, you know, just, we're just going to keep going on. <laughs> you know, there's an so interesting, in. I mentioned today in our, our discussion, the, the keynote about some of the challenges that families face 
when they return to their communities. And this is a particularly challenging issue um, when you think about a whole bunch of supportive housing settings that don't take kids. And so I actually had a case in child protection where the mom was in federal prison, the child support or the, the child welfare case had opened because the caregiver that was supposed to be providing care for the children in an informal family arrangement during the mom's incarceration decided she could no longer do it. And she dropped the kids off at a shelter and said, I'm sorry. Now, in fairness to this caregiver, these kids were very expensive. She had a small child of her own. This was a very complex family situation, and she did the best she could for as long as she could, and then she dropped the kids off at shelter. The child welfare case opened. Um, the challenge about this, right, was now we have a, chips, uh, a, a child welfare case. Mom was going to get out of prison. We had such a hard time communicating with the Federal Bureau of Prisons about her release date. They wouldn't tell us. Sorry, to the probation <laughs> officer in the room. Um, it was really difficult to get mom to participate in, in, the, criminal pro or in the, the child welfare proceedings because it was just difficult logistically. Um, mom was going to be released to a halfway house in, near the Twin Cities. And because she was going to be released to a halfway house, she was still technically under, she was still in custody. In the Federal Bureau of Prisons' eyes, that meant her kids couldn't be reunited there. But she was also not yet homeless, so she wasn't eligible for housing resources. So we couldn't reunify the kids because she didn't have safe and suitable housing, but she couldn't get housing because she didn't have her kids. And you would think, oh, there must be a creative solution to this. We went, we sat in a meeting with the dispositional advisor, the county attorney, the social workers for an hour and a half and made every phone call we could possibly make. And the solution we came up with was the day you are out of this halfway house, you take your bags down to Century Plaza, you check in as homeless, and as soon as you get yourself into a shelter, we will be able to reunify your kids there. The kicker of all of this, right, was that the child protection case never opened because of an issue with her parenting. She was a good mom who had made a mistake, and her kids were desperate to be reunited with her. And yet, here we had this child protection case that was essentially incompatible with her criminal case, and the housing restrictions were really, really challenging. And so I think Bobby's point is really well made, that we have to think about alternatives to incarceration, and we have to think of the family system so that we can think about ways to wrap our arms around this family and say, this is what we need. Yes, Leah. Well, I'm in correction. <laughs> Yeah. And so the same thing about if you, if, how do you how do you address the concern that if we start promoting that if you're pregnant you get you know mm -hmm. all these services at the end you get to come out then you know maybe the last four months of your baby's born you you're not in prison prison you're just in you know the probationary electronic monitoring I mean I'd like to believe that no one would ever do it but I've seen it yeah. I mean, It's a real challenge. I don't know how to repeat that question. <laughs> Everybody heard it in the room? OK, sorry, recording. Um, I think Leah's point is about you know how do we deal with the fact that I think it comes back to a lack of really comprehensive community resources that address the drug problems, that address the mental health problems, that address some of the root causes for why women are incarcerated in the first place, women and men. Um, because nobody, I mean, are you, do, do we really truly believe many of these individuals who are coming in and out for short periods of time are returning back to their communities with high levels of poverty and gang activity and lack of resources, and no better alternatives to then engaging in additional criminal activity and cycling back in. And so I don't have the right answer. I, I, I don't know. Um, some of you may be aware that Tennessee recently, there's been a lot of hullabaloo in Tennessee about criminalizing women who are doing drugs and such during their pregnancies. I see a couple pregnant ladies in the room. So. Um, this is a really interesting challenge because in rural parts of Tennessee, they're saying if you don't get treatment, you're going to prison because you are putting your baby at risk, which 
people recognize, right? But then they're mandating drug treatment that doesn't exist. So there's not enough drug treatment to go around. So these women are have this like delicate balance of I'm addicted to drugs, I'm pregnant. What do you do? And I don't know the answer. I think if I did, I would, you know, I don't know, go on a vacation because I'd be done working for a little while. I saw a hand over here. Yeah. We were. We had this conversation somewhere. Yes, that's true. And this is exactly the conversation that Bobby and I were having while you all were watching the film was this discussion of breastfeeding. And part of the question why the Department of Corrections wanted to know about that time between delivery and release was because they wanted some numbers to know how many of this, how many women would this impact if we were to move forward with some policies that would promote breastfeeding. So our moms are encouraged if they would like to initiate breastfeeding in the short time at, their, at the hospital for bonding. and all of the things that we know are good about those first 48 hours. Um, but there is no support at the Department of Corrections at the state level for breastfeeding. It's my understanding that in the federal prison in Waseca, that's that there is no support for breastfeeding there either. However, some of the county jails have more uh, connected relationships with departments of public health, and the public health departments in those counties run the jail medical unit. And in those cases, I think we've seen this incredible collaboration and recognition of this point, which is the breastfeeding is really important, not just for mom, but crucially important for baby. And so I think that as we've moved away to contracted healthcare providers in various counties, we've seen some of that creative thinking go out the window or a lack of recognition of the importance of breastfeeding. And it's, it's really unfortunate for a number of reasons. Bobby, you want to talk about how that came to be in New York? Because um, you had some. Well, we had two issues with breastfeeding in New York. One was moms didn't want to do it. Um, and so that was, that, that challenge was addressed kind of um, through education and through getting a lactation counselor to come in and make it a more comfortable situation. And they had a lot of good reasons for not wanting to do it. Um, corrections officers weren't necessarily comfortable with it, and so that would put, make mom uncomfortable. Um, sometimes they had associations with their breasts that, that made them uncomfortable. Um, sometimes it was just not part of their culture, not the way they were brought up, so it wasn't the way they were gonna raise their babies. What we found was that corrections was pretty supportive if we could um, do all the work. So, <laughs> including buy the breast pumps, you know, as long as we were willing to do the work. Um, and I saw some pretty amazing, um, pretty amazing things happen. But the one situation that Rebecca was, and I were discussing was when a doctor wrote a prescription for it. And that's actually kind of becoming, I think, in, in, in a lot of different areas of well-being, um, that's, I, I, I'm hearing some of that happening in other areas too, like this person needs an apartment. <laughs> I'm writing a prescription for an apartment. Um, so this baby was born with some pretty significant disabilities and was put into a, a rehabilitation center for its, um, out of the NICU and mom could see the baby um, but wasn't with the baby long enough to breastfeed the baby enough um, so she was permitted to pump and have staff transport the breast milk to the rehabilitation center, but only because that doctor wrote, that doctor said, this baby has to have breast milk. This baby can't have anything else. Um, otherwise, it probably wouldn't have happened that way. 
It just takes a tremendous amount of advocacy on the part of the civilians that work in those settings and actually some level of trust between corrections and those civilians that nothing's gonna go wrong. And that's really, you know, any of these issues like breastfeeding or providing supports that are counterintuitive to the correctional culture, um, there's, trust is huge. The Children's Center, um, the level of trust they had for me was phenomenal. I mean, I could go to my dep and say, listen, you know, we're thinking, you know, belly dancers, what do you think? And he would consider it. <laughs> you know, he may not say yes to it, but they had a lot of trust in me because they knew I wasn't gonna run afoul of them. And that was really, really important. I respected what they were trying to do, and so they respected what I was trying to do. And I think whenever you're trying to try new things, trust doesn't get established immediately. It can take years and years and years. Um, but breastfeeding is one of those things. They gotta know that nothing's gonna happen to that breast milk. There's not gonna be, you know, no one's gonna taint it. No one's gonna mess with it. No one's gonna, you know, uh, so, so uh, that, that prescription story was a, was a pretty cool thing. Yes, ma'am. So the question is, how do you keep hope alive in a maximum security prison? Um, but it's so interesting you asked that question because when I left, um, I gave all the women a card with a, a quote um, about hope because that's really all we did. That really was the substance of our work. Um, we couldn't guarantee outcomes. We couldn't say everything's gonna work out okay. We couldn't say, you're not gonna lose your kid. Um, we couldn't say a lot of things, but what we could say is, we're here with you while you go through whatever you're gonna go through, you're not alone. And I found that the women found hope in that. Um, I can remember one young woman who I unfortunately recently saw back in, um, she had a terrible, terrible history, this woman. She was raised in a cult and really sad, sad story. Shimini was her name. And she said to me, she was gonna lose her daughter, whom she adored, but she was in no position to take care of her child, and she knew it. But she said to me, I don't want my daughter to think I gave up hope on her. I don't want her to think, I'm gonna fight for her, not because I, I, wanna, hold, I wanna take care of her, I know I can't take care of her, I can't take care of myself, but I don't want her to think I gave up on her. And that's really what it is. It's, you know, sometimes you're gonna get a great outcome and you're gonna be happy and you're gonna say, hey, kid goes to college. But for me, those kinds of outcomes aren't the only measure. Um, what we did with the women here and what they did for us, because there was a lot of mutual um, uh, attachment going on, was help them earn a security they had never had in their lives and have hope that with that they could create a life for themselves. And so I, I don't know if that answers your question, but th that's really the substance of the work. Yeah. Sure no. <laughs> it's, it's hard finding hope in there. I mean, it's really difficult. Um, you can have um, a moment where you feel really optimistic, but it's not a culture where they're trying to inspire you to get out and take on the world. It's not that kind of, you know what I mean? And I don't want to, you know, lose sight of, you know, some people have committed some heinous crimes. Some people have done some pretty awful things. I think everybody is treated like they're just awful people when they're in there. So that's the thing. We have to change the culture of it. It's a culture of cruelty. So a lot of them don't want you to feel liberated. They don't want you to feel like you can get out and be great or, you know, do a bunch of... um exciting things. So I think, you know, a lot of times they're over penalized. And I think Mona mentioned that in the film, like it's punitive. The entire, you know, philosophy is, is punitive. And I think we lost a lot when we went from penitent penitentiaries to correctional facilities. A lot was lost there because um, penitentiaries, you had to come to terms with, you know, whatever you did, you had to you know, um, go through this level of repentance or, you know, becoming one with what happened. And that was lost. Now you go and it's just like, okay, you do your time, then you're released. 
only to start that cycle all over again of the collateral consequences, not being able to vote, not being able to get a nice place to stay. You might be able to get a place, but it's more than likely in a bad neighborhood. Then it's like nobody really wants to give you a job. And if you do get a job, they're not going to think about you as far as being a administrator or, a, a, you know, um, or executive. They only see you as a worker. So it's, it's a lot of stigma associated with uh, criminal offending. So a lot of them, you know, they might be hopeful and they might feel good and might be excited about a visit. But you see the, the lady, you know, had to lose her privileges just for a piece of gum. And it's like, how small is that? I understand what contraband, you know, <laughs> represents, but come on, man. How much damage are you going to really do with that piece of gum? Like, come on, you know? So it's like, that's the aura of it. So there's not a lot of hope. You might get hopeful, and, you, you know, seeing her definitely provides hope, or seeing Mona staying resilient is hopeful, but overall, it's a dreadful place, and, you know, they want you to feel... You know, I mean, I think it's the closest thing to death. Um, you work for 12 cents, 15 cents. It's the, it's the lowest, you know, um, while you're still alive. Yeah. The question was, what do kids need um, to get pulled through um, their tough times? Um, I, I like to utilize the strength-based approach. Um, that's been great for me because I work with kids as well. I work in District 287 with some of my people back there. Um, and a lot of them have parents who are incarcerated, and a lot of them um, – live through the lens of seeing the world from that incarcerated person. But I always tell them, the, you know, how great they are, um, regardless of the negative behavior I see. I always tell them the good I see in them. Even when they do something wrong, I might address it, but I still say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm telling you this because I love you. I look them in their eyes. I, you know, um, I'm there for them if they need letters of recommendation. I try to give them everything that they're missing. Of course, I can't replace their father or their mother or... Um, I might not even be able to help them get over the trauma they've experienced, but I always tell them, hey, you're great. You're, you're bigger than your problems. You know, um, if you need me, I'm here for you. That's what they need to hear. If you look at that strength-based approach, it's been used by social workers for over 20 years, and it's an evidence-based practice. They need to be able to, you know, feel like, hey, I might be going through this, but I'm resilient. I can handle this. I can walk through this. Even though it hurts like hell to have my parent away or have my uh, grandma or whoever away, you just got to keep telling them, like, hey, this is just temporary. This is a temporary pain. You know, think bigger picture. And I know that's pretty cliche as far as big picture, but they have to be able to see a little further. A lot of them kids can't see past next week. You have to be able to help them envision themselves in a different way, and you'll see changes. Because I, I, you can get back up if you want. Um, so when I talk to, especially young adults who can reflect back and say, like, you know, what, what was important to me at that time in my life, um, one of the things they always say is, "Don't label me by this experience. I am not my parent. I am not my parents' choices." I am my own person. And that I can still have a relationship with my parents, and then that's the second thing, which is really, I, don't, I think, hard sometimes for people to do when they hear kids tell their stories. But don't judge my parent. Don't tell me what to think about my parent. Don't tell me your opinion of my parent. And don't think that I'm like my parent. Because I, I feel like, it's not even, it's, it's beyond stigma. And in, even within families, you see the kid who's the cousin living with his cousins whose dad is locked up or whose mom is locked up. There's stigma even within families about that. Um, and so when I've heard kids say, that's what, the, that's, I'm not them. I'm my own person. I want to add one thing. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, there's been some compelling evidence coming out recently, too, that 
Um, they're both a lot taller than me, so I feel like I have to stand on my tippy toes. Oh, I need a box. Um, there's been some good research coming out recently that uh, for kids of incarcerated parents, the same protective factors work, work for them. What we would expect predicts good outcomes for them. Are the kids the same thing that kids without incarcerated parents need? So connections to school, um, feeling like they're connected and safe in school, uh, academic achievement is a strong protect, protective factor if we can get them there and they feel connected to school but that having someone within the school environment who they feel like cares about them, even if they're screwing up and has not pushed them away, because for so many of these kids, that like screw up, back away, the adult in my life has now backed away from me. Those kids need to connect in the very moment where they have pushed boundaries and pushed limits. And so the presence of a non-parental adult in their life, connections to school, uh, engagement in after-school activities. You know, Jason talks about basketball, but whether that's basketball or a sport or a club where they can connect with other kids. The, the science is starting to very clearly say the protective factors that we think for, you know, are good for all kids are the same things that are good for this group of kids. But recognizing Bobby's point, right, that they don't want to be stigmatized, they don't want to be labeled, they don't want to be expected that, you know, we're getting you off of this, this track that you're already on, but instead you're not on that track because your parent was. You have lots of opportunities. Yeah. And well, that's specifically what my question was to this sort of, what is that perspective? So my perspective for the individual correctional facility is the majority of the kids have a family member who's incarcerated. And sometimes when I listen to the conversation, just um, informal conversations between me and their moms when they're visiting, a lot of it is, hey, so and so you know, I don't know that there are stats on that. What percentage of incarcerated adults have incarcerated children? I do not know the answer to that. No, but I do know that within these data have not been published yet, but they are through the Minnesota Student Survey. So last year we worked pretty hard to advocate to get the Minnesota Student Survey to add a question about parental incarceration. And those uh, data are, well, the data are out, but there's not been something published on this. Um, I can tell you that among um, kids who are currently in correctional facilities, so this is kind of the flip side of your question, the kids who are currently in correctional facilities, I think it's one in four have a history of parental incarceration, or currently have a parent who's incarcerated. It's half of kids in correctional facility settings uh, have a history of parental incarceration. Um, so those cycles of incarceration are very strong. I think it's important to think about the intergenerational patterns of inequity that drive some of those, the, the systemic inequities that exist that help perpetuate intergenerational cycles of incarceration. I don't know, do either of you want to tackle the other piece of the question about how do we help kids change cognitive paradigms regarding they're on the pathway to prison? That's it. I'm going to just answer yes. that, because one thing I didn't say that I say at every one of these things, and I can't believe I didn't say it. Let's see the end of the day. If you have, if it's appropriate, um, include the incarcerated parent. And that's very counterintuitive to what some people think. But it was my experience in this work, and it continues to be, that that parent has a lot of power. And they if they're going through their own transformative process, if they are changing themselves, they can really be a part of their child's change. That's not always the case, and that's really a judgment call on the part of educators, social workers, counselors. But when it's, it's, it's it was, I, I say it because there, it's oftentimes not even on the list of things to do, to reach out to the parent who's locked up. But there are situations, and certainly, you know, you saw Tanika on the conference call. That was a common occurrence at the Children's Center. I would sit with, I would sit with moms, and they would be uh, involved in their children's therapy sessions. Um, these were moms who had made some real change in their lives, and they could, and that person can say to their kid, and they can say it in a way that almost nobody else can, you don't have to be me to love me. 
you can change this. I don't want this for you. And that message is really loud when it comes from the parent. It's not as loud when it comes sometimes from grandma <laughs> who's taking care of them because it has another feeling to it. Okay, this, this, this is what I was saying, like, as far as, you know, something that's just definitely going to alter their path to, you know, not going to prison, there, there's nothing that's going to, like, just, you know, halt, because some of them do believe, hey, my father was incarcerated, my uncle was incarcerated, I'm definitely going someday. A lot of them do believe that, but if you look at resiliency factors, resiliency factors have more predictive power than risk factors. In this work, we, we tend to look at, are they at risk of dropping out? Are they at risk of having a baby? Are they at risk of getting killed? Are they at risk of joining a gang? But if you look at resiliency factors, that has more predictive power than those risk factors. Risk factors. So you got to understand that when I'm working with these kids, it's not just fluff I'm giving them as far as, you know, saying all this touchy feely lovey stuff. It's resiliency. I'm building, I'm fostering resiliency in them so that when they do go through adversity, they could bounce back. Now, I had teachers, coaches, people who told me all of the right things. My mom always told me all of the right things, but when I was ready to change, I had something to go back to. People change, people don't change when they want to. People change when they feel they need to. There are things in our lives we should change. Some of us should quit smoking. Some of us uh, should uh, eat better. Some of us should uh, go to the gym more. Some of us should better manage our finances. But why don't we do it? So we try to, we try to put more pressure on kids to be resilient and do things that we didn't, uh, we don't put as much pressure on ourselves to change. So I think that's the biggest problem. We need to start focusing on how can this kid be resilient because this kid is going to have some insurmountable challenges ahead of him. How can I foster him or her to see that they can be resilient and overcome these challenges because they are there. They do have that image of, yeah, if you go to prison, you're a real man or, you know, you tough if you can make it through prison. Like that's in a lot of their minds. So what I do is I help them by saying, hey, you don't have, that's not what masculinity is. That's not what manhood is. So we have to have that conversation. What does it mean to be a man? That's when I use the motivational interviewing. Why would you want to stop smoking weed? Why why would you want to leave the gang? Then I can get a more pro-social answer. But if I ask them, you know, or tell them or try to give advice like a lot of us do and say, hey, you're going to end up dead or in jail. You know you're going to end up in prison. You know this is going to happen. That's ineffective. But if you make that question pro-social, why would you leave the gang? Why would you stop smoking weed? Why would you? The answer is only going to be a positive answer. That's how you help them get to a different place. But I look at that motivational interviewing, uh, have them look at the good and not so good of their behavior. That way they can come up with a um, solution on their own because, you know, we don't argue with our own data. So let me get the question right. Now, you're speaking of academic excellence. Like, for those who are not academically inclined, what else, what other supports would be put in place to help them or assist them? Um, like, what we're doing in District 287, we're actually helping them get on-the-job training. You know, if, because some of the kids I work with, they have low IQs. I've worked with a kid with an IQ of 59. That's, you know, pretty low. So they might not be on a track to um, college, but if we can get them some on-the-job training where they're working, where they understand the job and learn that job really well, then um, maybe they have a chance to be a productive citizen or be successful um, in the right way. So I would suggest, I wouldn't take college off of the table, but I would, you know, build up other capacities or competencies or strengths or attributes that will help them um, as they try to, you know, progress through this life. Unfortunately, a lot of those kids who you know, are not doing well in school, they will get labeled as, you know, Bobby stated. A lot of them, you know, are, 
we say they have low self-esteem and things like that, but a lot of them might just have low school esteem or low program esteem, where they can't see themselves getting through a particular program or particular classes, but they feel really good about themselves. So I would just build them up by giving them other opportunities to see life, see jobs, to see um, opportunities that might not um, be as, uh, or might not provide that academic rigor like in higher education. So college isn't for everybody. Some people um, do well and they've never been to college, but college does open up your mind. It broadens your perspectives. It does a lot of great things and it looks good on paper as well. <laughs> but um, a lot of them um, might just need to learn how to get other skills rather than focus on that academics. They can focus on getting trained and build up a resume, have a number of years at a particular job and that will take them places as well. I really don't know. Um, will you repeat the question? Oh, yeah. How will I have that <laughs> uh, conversation with my daughters about my past? Um, I really I really don't know. Um, what I do is I talk to kids. Um, I've talked to kids at Boys Totem Town, Red Wing, and I ask them um, when would be a good time for me to tell them because I really don't know. But my daughter is going to find out. I'm going to have to keep things hidden from her. But she's, she's smart. You know, she's our, I mean, the girl is brilliant. So she picks up on things, you know, and she already has questions. And I just simply tell her, you're not ready for me to talk to you about that right now. Um, but, you know, I was working on a presentation um, when I was going to Tennessee. And um, I thought my daughter was involved in, you know, what she was doing as far as painting in the house and stuff. And, um, she came over, I'll never forget, she was chewing her gum. She looked at the slides. She said, Daddy, you been to jail? I'm like, get away, right now, get, get, get. Like, I'm like, oh my God. And I told my wife, like, man, I think, you know, Janae saw those slides, so I don't know. But she's smart and she picks up on things. You know, I've had to keep things hidden as far as the book, as far as, you know, a number of different things. But um, she's already working on computers at school. You know, she's really gifted, so they, and it's like she Google Earthed our, you know, um, where we live and, you know, done all these great things. And I'm like, this girl is going to find out pretty soon. So um, I think the time is coming where I have to have that discussion. But um, I'm not sure of what that would look like. I don't know if that would be like, a, you know, giving her a pass to do things or get in trouble. So, you know, I'm a little hesitant of that, but um, I really don't know. What what I work that wasn't a question. She made a statement. Just so we <laughs> mono mono. Yeah, but um I, I, I worry I worry about telling that story. It does inspire a lot of people, but I wonder how many people hear my story and say Hey, if that guy got shot and he's a three-time felon, I'll be okay. I can get in trouble and one day turn it around. I don't know. So I'm always like, like there's so much or so many things that are unclear to me that I'm worried. Like, I feel like I'm inspiring people and the responses I get from kids and people all across the country is great. It's overwhelmingly positive. But some of those kids have to be saying, hey, if this kid, if this guy gang bang for all those years and was a leader in the gang and went to prison, I can do that too. So I can go do prison time. I can go do this and then I'll turn it around just like he did. Some of them have to be taken that away. I would think so, but not really sure. But I would tell them the entire story because it's like I'm getting tired of trying to protect them from it because my sister wanted to talk to me this weekend about different things in the book and then my aunt wanted to talk about different And I'm like, hey, they don't know. And, and, you know, so it's like the time is coming. I, I'm just not fully prepared for that conversation. My full name is Jason Marquis Soul. Uh, and the book is called From Prison to PhD, a memoir of hope, resilience, and second chances.
Yeah. And now you're well known, and clearly mm-hmm. it wasn't that many years ago. There's people out there who can know where you are. Absolutely. So how, how, do you, how did you lead to safety? The question was, how did I lead to safety from um, the gang experiences and the gang uh, lifestyle? Well, for me, I started telling people before I was released that I wasn't going to gang bang anymore. They just laughed. They didn't take it seriously. they like, hey, what are you going to do? You know, like, because they're accustomed to me being around when things happen, you know, to figure out, you know, how we're going to make money. They depended on me in a lot of ways, but um, I told them that I was going to do something different, and they didn't believe it. And that's why Hazel didn't document my struggle, because I, I still love them. You know, I mean, it, the, the love doesn't go away. We made it through some pretty tough times together. And um, that doesn't change, you know, how I felt about them. So, in a sense, I felt like I was, you know, um, betraying them. But on the other hand, I felt like, man, hey, I only have one life. And I'm going to make the most of this thing. And now a lot of them want to follow my path. So, um, it's great. I don't know how safe I truly am. I mean, I'm everywhere. I'm doing the work. Um, they see me in parades and all of that kind of stuff, but I don't know if somebody will wake up and say, hey, we need to go talk to Jay about the stuff in the past. I don't know, you know, so um, I feel safe. I'm comfortable. I go to Chicago all the time. People know me. I'm working with gangs, but um, I really don't know how many people still identify me as you know, who I, who I used to be, but I'm totally, you know, I feel totally safe. You know, I feel comfortable taking my kids to Mall of America or wherever we go. So, um, I don't feel it. And I see people I had issues with in the past. I see the family members of the guy who shot me. I see people I had fights with while incarcerated. I see them, but they see me as, you know, just someone who's changed, someone who's doing better. And, a lot of them just really, you know, love what I'm doing, and they want me to continue to do it. Like, I do initiatives downtown St. Paul, Minneapolis, and a lot of people know that I'm doing some great work. So I'm visible. I'm out here. It's not like I'm in hiding or anything. So I don't know. I feel pretty safe. I was blessed then. Because I was blessed then, I didn't have to get any repercussions leaving. You know, um, if I came in and was jumped in or I did an initiation or anything like that, then they have a hold on me. But because I was blessed then, it was easy for me to say, hey, you know, I'm out. So they, you know, give me the blessing to go. Because even my cousin, who's the prince of a gang, um, he's just getting released from the Federal Bureau of Prisons after doing seven and a half. And he's a defined uh, gang leader. He was okay when I started changing. He wasn't all the way okay with it, but he's like, man, you really want to do that? You really want to go there? And it could have went either way. You know, so um, you never really know when you say you're going to walk away or you're done, you know, because there are a lot of people who think they need you in that gang for recruitment. I'm, I was valuable to the gang. You know, I can tell you all about it. I could tell you the laws, the bylaws, what it meant, um, where the origins are. Like, I could really convince you to join our gang. And, you know, and I wasn't a scary person. So they saw me as somebody who can make the gang strong. But when I said I was going to do something different, man, a lot of them said, man, go ahead, man, do it, man, strive. You know, and it's, you know, it's just, I'm just grateful that they did that because they could have very well tried to pull me back into that world. I, I don't, truthfully, I've been able to like really not really interact with them too much. But since this book has come out, everybody, like people on Facebook contact, people who I haven't heard from in years are coming back. Man, I'm proud of you. Man, I live some of that with you. Like if you look, if you go to my Facebook, like people saying, man, I remember I live certain parts of your story. I remember being there. So it's like I'm reaching back in a sense that I, I can say, hey, man, if you need a conversation, if you need me to, like, you know, put you onto a job or you need me to assist you or your family in any kind of way, I'll do that. You know, like I say, I still love them. But as far as reaching back, I'm not, you know, it, it's only I have a limit. You know, I like I care about my wife and my daughters and, you know, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure I keep that solid. So, um, 
I reach back as far as I can, but that's not really my main, you know, objective. You know, I love them. I create opportunities. When my cousin got out, I picked him up. I drove him to where he needed to go. You know, I gave him money so he could get a bus pass. Like, I do those things, but I'm, I'm careful about how far I go with that because I'm not going to, you're not going to see me every day. You're not going to see me every week. You might see me once every two months or something like that, but I'm not going to be connected with your life like that. It's too risky for me. I don't know what you're doing when I'm not around you. I don't know if people still want to do something to you. I don't know what your prison experience was totally like. I don't know if people are looking for you for something. So I just can't be too involved in their life. Even though I love them, I care about them. I just can't. Um, for me and my sanity and what I'm trying to do, it's just not that beneficial for me. Well, I can give you, the question is, are there resources available about the gang culture or gang violence? Um, there are resources, but um, they're going to trick you. It's their job to trick you. It's not beneficial to have you to, to know what they're doing. So it's their job to keep you off balance, as well as law enforcement. But the gang culture is changing so much. I mean, it's not the traditional gangs anymore. They're more click-based. They create new gangs now. They have hybrid gangs where you can see Bloods and Crips together, and they create a new name. So it's always evolving. But I can give you um, resources, but um, they change week to week. The rank even changes like if you have a car you might be the leader if you can get your hands on two guns you raise up in, in rank as well so it's so offset back in the 80s and 90s when they were called super gangs you could really track them you knew who was the leader you knew what they follow you knew their beliefs you knew what the six point star meant nowadays all of that is is tarnished it's all blurred so you can't keep up with them as good but i can give you um some resources Well, you know, the media is pervasive. The question was, is it due to the media? Media creates moral panic, makes you, you know, more afraid than you really need to, than, than you really need to be. But um, the media plays a part, but there are things that happen that make people more um, aware or have heightened awareness about gangs as well. So it's a number of different things because gangs are still here. They're going to be here. If we don't look at um, what are the conditions that make somebody want to join a gang, then we won't get anywhere. Because people know what happens when you're in gangs. If we can't stop them from believing like that's their best way of overcoming their situations, then we won't get anywhere as far as gangs. We'll keep trying to follow them. But if we start looking at what's causing them to join gangs, we'll be in a better place to stop it. It is time for us to wrap up. Um, I might ask our speakers to just stay for a few minutes if there is any a last minute question, but if you could please join me in thanking Jason and Rebecca and Bobby. And then one last call for your evaluations, both the small MACMA evaluations and the larger white ones. Uh, Judy is at this back door, and if you could go, go out that door and hand your evaluations to her, that would be terrific. Thank you so much. Have a safe trip home. <laughs>